Want to know how I did something like this where there are 2D characters on a 3D set? Watch the video to find out more. Hey guys, it's Tini Komentoa, and today I'd like to talk about how I did a test of 2D characters composed right into a 3D set. First of all, no, this isn't a thing where the background is pre-rendered and then I do the characters on top of that 3D footage. These are actual image planes placed into the 3D environment, casting shadows, reacting to lighting, and having shader and material presets that make 2D animation feel more than just a drawing. One of the things I'm known for and why a lot of people did follow me on social media was because of these casual dancing dog animations I did where I placed them and motion tracked them with live action footage, an effect you'd kind of see in a movie like Space Jam. Every time I did a new dancing dog loop, I would do it with new live action footage, but this time I wanted to use a project where I could learn and implement some new media experimentations. Instead of using live action footage, why not use 3D scans? I had an iPhone 6 for years. It was almost just a year ago that I upgraded to a 12 Pro. Did you know that the iPhone 12 Pro has a LiDAR camera or scanner? This is what allows it to do 3D scans and I guess some advanced facial motion capture. I got this idea from the channel Corridor Crew, one of my favorite YouTube channels out there. I highly recommend you guys to follow them if you're interested in experimentation, VFX, animation, AI, stunts, film. It's a really entertaining, fun channel or it's just a bunch of guys just experimenting and making stuff. Something that I just want to do. So I visited a park during the day and using my iPhone, I used an app called Scaniverse. And this is what allows me to scan my overall environment and turn it into a 3D model. The way it works is like you're recording a normal footage, but you're gliding your camera over the surfaces of what you're scanning or you're recording. And what you'll notice is that it's slowly starting to create a 3D mesh with the actual texture and it'll start filling in empty spaces for that mesh. And then once you're done, you can save it as a low res or a high res model using low res or high res textures. Then once that's done and once you're ready, you can then export that into a file format to your liking. FBX is what I used a lot for production and storyboarding, and it's something that Blender can also take in too. You can save it in your phone or export it into a cloud. So you can export it into Google Drive and then just download it from Google Drive into your PC. There are other 3D scan apps that you can use on the iPhone like Polycam, but Scaniverse was the first one I could find and that there wasn't a paywall for the export options. Scaniverse is also free. Okay, we'll save that stuff for later. Now I'm going to talk about the 2D animation side, which I use TV Paint, and it's also what I used to do the previous dancing dog loops. I just watched a bunch of shuffle dance videos, looked at them frame by frame, and heavily referenced them for my new dancing dog loop. Then I exported it into an image sequence. I usually use alpha channel PNG with no background, just a character animation with color and cleanup. I personally like to have animated image sequences in its own folder with nothing else in there. Now I know a bunch of you guys will be asking, why TV Paint and not Grease Pencil? If I'm going to use Blender, why not use Grease Pencil? The simple reason is that I'm much faster on other 2D animation programs besides Grease Pencil. And I know I'll get a lot of comments saying why not use Grease Pencil or why I'm not taking advantage of it. And I get it, Grease Pencil is nice, it's free, and it can be powerful. It's free like Blender. Personally, I'm just not a fan of Grease Pencil, of how it feels. And I'm not someone who draws strokes using the Z-axis. I don't draw things coming in and out of depth. I tend to keep things in 2D. And also, I like the feel of other 2D animation programs besides Grease Pencil. Also, there are some great advantages when importing your animation as an image sequence, such as being able to utilize 3D shaders on your 2D animation. An example of this would be things like bump mapping or normal maps or specular maps or even material mapping where you assign color codes to apply a different type of material to code it with the color of your animation. With Grease Pencil by default on its own, you can't really do that unless you export it into an image sequence and then import it back into an image texture. Since Grease Pencil has its own unique shaders, but that's only if you want to go extra with the image textures and shaders. You could still fully animate and color a character in Grease Pencil and this effect will work just as fine. At this point, it's really just a matter of preference. 
The reason why I choose to use TV Paint is because it has some great functionality for 2D animation. TV Paint 11, for example, has a great feature called CTG Layers and Coloring, which has changed my approach to coloring in TV Paint. What it is, is that it uses a source, for this case, the line art of my animation. Then you can indicate strokes to tell the program where to fill the colors and you can even color code palettes. And it does a lot of like AI and calculations. So you don't need to do things like gap closer or range or anything like that manually. It just calculates it. There's tutorials of this on YouTube if you're interested in that. Now it's time for me to put everything together using Blender. Just letting you guys know this isn't a step-by-step -step tutorial, it's just me talking about the process. So now we can start importing our 3D scans. Once you download your 3D scans and it'll be an FBX file, so you can import them as an FBX and it'll import it as a mesh with its own textures too. Now this part is super cool. You can arrange your 3D scans, duplicate them, rotate them, scale them. If you're really ambitious, you can apply material shaders onto it, but I like to keep things simple. I'm only using three different scans, a hallway, an outside of the building, and a pond, but I'm duplicating, multiplying, and arranging them to make a completely new environment. Something like this can be really awesome for setting a storyboard or layout scene, or maybe even prototype level design for video games. Now the reason I say that is because the scans themselves are very chunky and blotchy. They're not polished models, but personally I find this stuff pretty appealing. Okay, now it's time to add our 2D animation onto the scene. You're going to want to have the Blender add-on switch on called Import and Export Image as Planes. You can find this in the add-ons menu, just make sure it's switched on. This is what allows you to add image planes as an object. You'll notice a new option pop up. When you add an object, there's a thing called Add the Image as Planes. Find the folder you exported your animation and import it as an animated image sequence. So for this case, I totally forgot to do that, but no worries, that can be fixed when you open the shaders window. You know, find the node with your texture and fix some parameters. Change it so it's recognizing it as an image sequence. Make sure you have the total frames match your actual animation file. If it's too little, the animation will end abruptly. Too much or maybe too far, Blender won't be able to find those frames because it doesn't exist. It'll just replace it with some weird texture or mesh. So if it's a loop, make sure you put the exact frame number and turn on cyclic. This allows it to loop. All right, so when you switch your viewport shading options to something that's close to the render, now it's going to implement lighting. Now, there's a few things that you're going to notice. The character animation looks a bit too dark, and the jarring thing is that the shadows don't match with the actual animation. It just matches with the plane. Or the animation itself isn't transparent and actually renders a black background as a replacement, and there's ways to fix that. On the material settings window, you're gonna to wanna to switch the shadow mode and the blend mode to alpha clip. So now it has no background and the shadows actually match the transparent properties of the original image texture and animation. And if you feel that the animation is too dark, if you go to your node window, you can actually drag the point of the color of the texture towards the emission and then use the emission strength values to crank it up or crank it down. If it's too much, it'll glow and it won't really react to things like shadows. Now from here on, it's just me playing around with the lighting, the world, and some textures. Now you probably noticed that I was looking at the world with flat, with you know no lighting or just default lighting, but you can switch that with the viewport shading and set it to the rendering shading. So you can actually see the world with lighting and some material information. For my render engine, I'm just using EV. Cycles is a bit too extra and EV can do the job really well. And from the render engine settings, I could adjust bloom effects, screen space reflection maps, motion blur if there's animation and camera moves and such. I also changed the properties of the world shader and this allows you to add things like sky boxes, sky colors, or any other texture that you'd like, or a color. I even experimented with the texture of the animation itself and I gave it a bit of bump mapping. And if you guys don't know what bump mapping is, they're basically height maps that instruct the material in how to react to lighting. I didn't make a new animated texture like I would do with the Nighthound project. I just used the same cleanup final color animation that I did for the Dancing Dog animation and just used that and it's good enough. But that's the main advantage of importing 2D animation as image textures. You can really take advantage of the 3D shaders that Grease Pencil by default doesn't have. 
Now it's time to make a camera. This allows me to do things like depth of field or change the length of the lens, and I can even animate them, change its properties while it's moving around. I even animated the sunlight in the environment. Special thanks to my friend Alan, he also has his own channel on Blender tutorials that you guys can look up, but he was helping me walk through this stuff and he was showing me some great tips when it came to Blender. Showing me stuff like adding modifiers to the camera and all this gizmo stuff on planes and things like that. It's just too much to cover in this video. Now I experimented a lot with different shots, basically just duplicating my dog characters, putting them in another place in the environment, and I animated that texture maybe running down the corridor. I have multiple cameras for different shots, and they're all happening at the same time. I just selected a different camera when I rendered the output for it. There were a few cool tips that I learned from Alan regarding cameras. So let's talk about depth of field. You can actually set the depth of field so it focuses only on the character, so everything behind the character and in front of the character will be blurred out. Or instead of setting the depth of field properties to the character, you can set it to an object known as an empty. And if you guys don't know what a null object is, I talk about it in After Effects. It's something that won't appear in the final render, but it's great if you want to parent characters on top of the null object. So when you move the null object, you're moving the character too without affecting the character. It works the same way in Blender. So I can use this empty object to determine the depth of field which is highly useful for things like rack focus. And that's just it, there's a lot of possibilities that are quite endless. Like I was being shown on how to do a quick water effect using a few shaders that create that cheap water illusion. And honestly, I found something small, like a character's reflection being shown on the water while the character is 2D animated, mind blowing to me, while reflecting the rest of the environment. And this is the type of automation that I like to see when it comes to marrying 2D animation and 3D graphics. I experimented with a lot of random stuff. Maybe another world was falling into the scene while the camera kept rack focusing back and forth from the background falling into the scene with our dancing character. Maybe I could duplicate all my dancing dog characters on one plane of the world and I could duplicate all of that and have it flip upside down and now that world is following into the main world. And while this is happening, I'm adjusting the focus and I'm adjusting the length of the lens so it looks like it's foreshortening and things are getting crazy and it's all super exciting. And it just makes me realize that Blender can also be a great compositing tool for 2D animation and 2D assets. Now, like I said, all of this stuff is taking place at the same time. All these different shots are happening at the same exact time. I just happen to have multiple cameras for each of these shots. But when I render them, I'm basically rendering each camera one by one. Now for the render engine, like I said before, I use Eevee because I still think it looks great and I don't need anything more than that. But if you really want to bust your computer's nut, you can try and use Cycles, which is basically ray tracing at that point. And if your computer is not strong enough, it'll take forever to render. You can render them as image sequences, but for something like this that's pretty small and nothing too serious, I just render them as videos. You can even change the directory output, the format, the size, the quality, and the video codec. You can even automatically do this by pressing Shift and F12 or by clicking on Render Animation under the Render tab. But before you hit that Render button, make sure you have the camera selected that you want to render. As for the final color adjustment and compositing and adding things like noise, vignettes, or posterizing effects, I just use After Effects. Adjust the color curves, the color settings, the, the color strength, and apply other post effects. So that's about it. I had a lot of fun doing this and I'm glad I recorded and documented myself doing this since, since there was a lot of things and tips and tricks that my friend showed me and things that I was experimenting with that I might soon forget. That's why you should record and document every project that you do. If you guys were inspired to do something like this because of this video, give me a shout out when you do share your experimentations and I'd love to see them and share them on social media. If you guys want to see a step-by-step -step tutorial of this, let me know in the comments down below. Anyways, thanks so much for watching this, bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.